Le fond, comme chaque année, l'introduction est faite par Dan Jones, le fondateur du mouvement Lean, qui va nous parler de là où il en est dans sa réflexion sur le Lean. Dan, your turn. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I've got a mic. Oh, yeah. you've got a mic. Perfect. Okay. It doesn't work. I, I escaped because I was fearing Michael was going to say all kinds of things <laughs> about me before I appeared on the stage, and he didn't, so thank you. Oui, ça fait ça fait des années qu'on travaille ensemble et c'est vrai qu'on se connaît un peu bien donc. Do you need more introduction, Dan? Okay. You have to. Dan, le cofondateur du mouvement Lean. Sorry. Okay, 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 okay. So I just got my technical instructions. Yes, this is the sixth time I've I've introduced this summit, and this is going to be the last time, I guarantee. Next time, somebody else is going to take the baton. No. <laughs> now I've done my bit. This is really your turn to take the movement on. And uh, I think my task today is just to summarize the latest findings, the latest state of uh, our thinking about lean, and then to offer you some, um, some ideas for the future, because I don't know what comes next. And I'm absolutely fascinated by the future and will observe what you do. But it's up to you. So I'm going to just offer some comments on the work we've done and some comments on, uh, on issues that I think are burning issues that we need to address in the next phase of the Lean Movement. Because the Lean Movement uh, will continue, I have no doubt. So, in that spirit, let me see if I understand this. Yes, I do. Okay. So a few years ago, uh, looking at the widespread adoption of lean by big corporations in particular, but also increasingly by mid-sized corporations, uh, these were enthusiastically adopted by CEOs who look for lean consultants to come in and do lean to my organization. How many times have I heard that? And we'll set up a lean team and we'll collect all the lean tools, and we'll develop a lean vision and a roadmap, and we will roll this lean program following the Six Sigma program they did a few years ago. We'll roll the lean program across the organization. Many of you have survived some of those. <laughs> and as you know, they come and they go. And I could see that. I've been involved in observing many, many lean programs come and go. I've involved in starting and initiating some of them, I have to admit. So in a sense, initiating some of the experiments from which I could then learn. And I could see these were running into the sand. And uh, recently I received confirmation from one of the big consulting groups, and they said, we can't sell lean anymore. So we're selling what our practice is now an operations excellence practice. And you can either think that's a good thing or a bad thing. The bad thing is that we're no longer hot. People have done lean, they tried that, didn't work, didn't last, and now they're on to something else. The consultants admit the operations excellence work they're doing is, has far less potential than the lean work that they used to, to try and sell. I think it's a great step forward because that actually signals the end of a phase of lean that was being used and thought about through very traditional management spectacles. So, lean programs in that sense have had their day. And that's very good because actually now it's our turn to restate what approach to lean really is about. We were addressing a situation in which traditional management was looking for experts to design an alternative system, an alternative value stream design, et cetera, et cetera, for middle managers to force employees to comply with. Give them some training, absolutely, 
<coughs> but actually the training is there so that people will know what they have to do. What they have to do. So it was about static optimization, and it was also about optimizing pieces. Most of the activity actually was always within each functional piece. Because immediately they started bringing the pieces together, of course, and taking away the buffers that had been carefully put there to insulate every piece from each other. Now those buffers were being removed. And suddenly the whole thing began to fall to pieces. Because traditional management <coughs> is about optimizing individual pieces. Functional budget responsibility, optimizing individual pieces. And the pieces performed OK, but they're not perfect at all. And when you start bringing the pieces together, of course, then the fact that none of the pieces actually work means that the whole system is vulnerable to any interruption in the whole system. So actually, in, inter in gradually moving from optimizing pieces to optimizing a system, we are revealing a whole new set of problems that actually we still don't recognize. Many managers still don't recognize. Because they recognize problems as engineering or system design problems that we have experts <coughs> to, to solve. And we have compliance problems and we have maintenance department and so on to make sure that people run the system as it was designed. And optimize the, the individual pieces. Now, of course, when we are moving into a world in which we're talking about integrated value streams, we're talking about integrated systems, you are actually multiplying the probability of failure by the probability of all of the pieces in the system. And also, the system becomes vulnerable to any of the pieces that are not performed right first time, on time, every time. So a whole new set of problems that we still don't recognize. We recognize there's waste. Yes, there was lots of waste between all of the pieces in the past. That's how it was designed to work, with very, very low levels of quality at every point. The level of quality necessary to create an integrated system and the level of engagement of the people at the front line um, is of a different order of magnitude. So we're dealing with a different set of problems. So a set of problems at the Gemba of Gemba experience of trying to make even the best designed system work. <coughs> so it was all about static optimization and about training and compliance. And that, unfortunately, is a lot of what business is still about. And it became clear to me not only that the traditional approach to transformation was not going to last, but also that if we continue to see lean through traditional management spectacles and thinking, we would maybe marginally improve those results, but actually we wouldn't be anything like utilizing the true potential of lean. Because there's not a real recognition of the nature of the problems that actually will lead us to the kind of actions that will improve both the quality of every step, but also the ability to link those steps together into a better performing system. And then there was another leap, of course, which is that taking the knowledge of what it takes to run an integrated system to work and digging deeper to the underlying causes of those problems and addressing them is not just significant for solving that problem right there and then, but actually has the potential to feed back into the design of next generation product and process. And I always saw Lean as really the potential of Lean was to uncover all of those problems and the assumptions and the design assumptions behind those systems so that we can design a new alternative learning from those. <coughs> so product process design actually is the ultimate real gain from the. So rule-based bureaucracies, bureaucracy, amazing invention, European invention. 
Yeah, Max Weber is alive. Fantastic in a world where we want to standardize the delivery of the product, government services, whatever. Um, Rule-based bureaucracies are the way to deliver that. They're also the biggest obstacle we face. And I'll come back to that. And silos also. We deeply develop silos so that we cannot actually look across the entire value stream. And as we discover from Ori, from working with Ori, um, the finance, the, not only do managers not actually see the nature of the problems, of the real problems that bedevil day to day and bedevil trying to integrate this into a system, but also they can't uh, see that in the numbers that they use to drive the business. So if you can't see the problems, the true scale of the problems that the irritations that bedevil your system create every day, and you can't also see the solution to those problems. And so, yeah, get rid of waste, that's a good thing, but actually those are things that the engineers should have sorted out. So managers, too, are actually quite blind. So, let me press the right button here, not the wrong one. So let's go back. 30 years ago, when we were in the fortunate position of benchmarking the auto industry globally and dis stumbled across Toyota and Toyota's superior performance in every dimension, the thing that was most striking was here was an example of a people-centric system that delivered superior performance. Staggering, staggering finding, and one that drew us, and I think everybody else, to take a deeper interest in this. Because it provided an alternative to the traditional mechanistic, finance-driven bureaucracies that we have created in the previous era. So that's the, the true inspiration for us that has driven us on to understand what is a people-centric system and what is meant by a people-centric system based upon learning. And I think we got the message that it's about learning. I still think we are struggling to understand what does that mean. Learning what and learning how. And I'll come back to that later on in my talk. But in struggling with these issues, um, Michael and I and uh, Jacques and Ori gradually started exchanging emails and writing articles together. And we find, found that we were learning a lot from each other. And that gradually crystallized into a synthesis that... Uh, we now present as the Lean Strategy book. And I'm not going to dwell a lot on, on that book except to add some comments on how you might read that and use it in your own, in your own lives. I mean, really, the experience for me, and it's an experience that I think is, is very general. My ex experience working with Jim many years ago in writing the, uh, the Machine That Changed the World, which was the result of a big team research effort, was that as we sat in a seminar room, a lecture room with actually blackboards in those days around the walls, and we brainstormed the data we had and the insights we'd had from, from different visits and so on, uh, we gradually discovered uh, a synthesis emerging, not from any one of us, but from the interaction between us. And that's also my experience with this book. It's the complementarity of the four authors who have never actually been in the same room together until today. Okay? Thanks to the internet and so on, we have been exchanging ideas and meeting in airports and, and various different places on one-to-one. -one. It's the synthesis of the four views that leads to the ideas... <coughs> coming up in the middle of us. 
So great ideas come through a dialogue. And great ideas come through a dialogue where you are struggling together to try and understand and deepen your understanding of a real problem. So I've described the problem we were seeing. And we were stumbling to create a coherent vision of the, an answer or a framework to answer those questions. And that's been an extraordinarily powerful process. And what we did was we took the a group of companies in France, largely inspired by Freddie and Michael, and the, nurtured by the French Institute, as a unique cohort of, of organizations, not only just had first generation leaders, but <coughs> leaders who'd also often been through a traditional view of lean with a traditional lean program and consultants help and so on but actually had come to realize themselves that actually the only thing that will stick is a leader taking active responsibility for leading and for helping create an understanding in the organization of the organization's problems. And we'll talk about that in a minute. By leading to find the right problems, by <coughs> committing to develop the capabilities in the organization to solve those problems. And by being able to translate and see the business consequences of doing so. So these were CEOs who, are, who had gone through a personal transformation, and I think this is extremely important, a personal transformation of, of realizing that actually they are the problem. and that they have to solve the problem. They have to embark on their own personal journey. And that's quite a profound thing to do for an executive who's very busy and who can't see into the organization because a bureaucracy naturally hides problems and protects itself against blame. And uh, who doesn't clearly see unless they are exceptionally driven to go and visit the Gemba, who can't actually really recognize the nature of the problems that are actually the food for lean. Those tiny day-to-day -day incremental improvements that add up to a system that performs a lot better than a series of broken pieces that are inter interdependent. So I'm not going to go through the book in great detail, but just to add some comments. Oh, yeah. <coughs> you can see we're not alone. A lot of others have been, uh, or some others, have been addressing these issues, uh, and we've drawn on that, and they have hopefully also drawn on us. Uh, this is a debate that's going on in the Lean Movement, and our book is the a, is a latest contribution to, to that. But perhaps the most significant underpinning in the book that emerges again out of our discussions is the thought process, the development process, the way of thinking that not only leaders, but particularly leaders, need to, to recognize and, and to think about in a very different way. There is a reason why we call the book Lean Thinking. And that because underneath this is a very different way of thinking that emerges out of acting in a very different way. So it's not thinking that emerges from reading a book. It's thinking that emerges from practice and reflection. That is how we learn, through practice and, and, and reflection. This is how we jump to solutions. We all think about the ideal system, the ideal goal, the thing that we must have, the plan we must develop as the answer to the problem in an environment in which we can see the outside probably clearer, the competition and so on, than we can what's going on inside the organization although we kid ourselves that we can see better inside than outside. And so the sequence, the traditional sequence we all have grown up with, 
is to define a goal based upon limited information and hunch. You're the top person in the room, the most expensive person. You are paid to know the answer. And having done that, to get a team together to develop a plan. I just like that uh, rollout that I described of a transformation plan. Develop a transformation plan with all the training material, all of the investment calculations done to perform, to, to implement. So plan, plans are then given out to the organization to implement and uh, management has to deal with the consequences of the kickback in the organization and of all of the unintended consequences that emerge from a plan that was not grounded in reality. And probably most of the managers at that point have moved on to different responsibilities. And it may even be that the CEO has moved on to a different responsibility as well when the plan didn't work out. Buying another computer system to solve a problem. We've all done that? Yes, we've all done that. Those looking at uh, insights into how to think differently about strategy, the, uh, the military are way ahead of this. They've realized very on that Plans rarely survive the first contact with the enemy. And so there's a growing number of uh, insights and movements to think about how do we develop the capabilities of the front line so that when they do meet the enemy and when the situation isn't exactly as planned by headquarters, they can take the right action without having to go back right up through the chain of command and so on. So plans are everything. Planning is everything. Plans are worthless. I think Eisenhower said that years and years ago. So from that insight, we can think about find, starting the decision-making process in a different place. And that is going and finding the underlying problems in the organization. And where can you find the underlying problems of the organization? You can only find them by going to the Gemba. Finding this gold dust of day-to-day -day problems and helping the front line resolve and address those issues. But in doing so, reflecting on what are the actual systemic root causes of those problems emerging day-to-day. So leaders can only learn by observing and helping others learn in solving their problems. It reveals the underlying assumptions, design assumptions, systematic uh, behaviors, and so on and so forth, that are actually causing those problems in the first place. So leaders learn to understand the fundamental problems for which they are responsible and they are cap only capable of solving by observing the learning of others. Most important. And then having identified some of the potential causes, underlying causes, start measuring those. Start facing up to them. Start measuring the consequences. Seeing the consequences of that problem occurring here, which is a tiny problem, but where that occurs right throughout the organization, what is the systemic cost of that? Being able to see the system-wide consequences of, of, those, uh, of the results that you create by measuring those, those new aspects, those new, new things. Then we're in a position to design a whole series of experiments to address those problems. And in such a complicated, multifaceted situation, we are never going to solve it through one set of experiments. It's going to be a whole series of experiments in which the organization tries different things to solve that systemic set of problems. 
And then out of the emerging results, we can form a solution that captures the learning from those ex and builds that into a, a very differently designed system uh, for the future. So the thought process is fundamentally different. And it's something you can read about in a book. But I think the real, from my experience of uh, playing with this change of thought process and trying to articulate this as a thought process, is that it's actually a very powerful way for your own learning process. So think about this as you think about your own, uh, your own problems, your own situations. What are the underlying problems that you can begin to see that you couldn't see before? And then so on and start going through that process. So it's using this 4F framework as opposed to the traditional 4D framework in recognizing the difference that actually is extremely powerful. So just reading this is the same as trying to learn something from a book. Actually playing and working with this and thinking it through in your situation is how you will learn the full power of this different way of thinking. Now we're not saying this is the only way you could frame this different way of thinking, but it is a start. It's our way that we've come up with and we've tested and we've honed and re refined. Um, please structure a slightly different version for yourself. That's absolutely fine. We're not saying this is not something that Toyota does that we can copy, right? Which is a very stupid thing to try and do anyhow. This is a framework for you to think about how your thought structure works. Second sort of summary learning from the book is that uh, we now see then that in that find, face, frame loop, how we design the experiments is extremely important. And the Toyota production system provides the set of learning frames to not only address the problem or the series of problems we're trying to find countermeasures for, but actually in doing so to change the assumptions we have about the way things work. It leads to counterintuitive thinking about quality, about visual, making work visual, about clinking things together about pull, about Kaizen. All of those things change as we use these frames, these learning frames. And it's very interesting that actually the real insight from learning is not the solution you come up with for that problem in that situation at that time. The real value of learning is that change of thinking <coughs> that occurs as you reflect on what you've learned by going through that process. Which is why the sensei is rarely interested in the results that you've come up with in your A4 exercise. They're interested in looking at what did you learn. When you read an A4 correctly, you can actually see the thought process, the evolution of the thought process, <laughs> as well as the evolution of the of the problem-solving process itself. Because it is the reusable knowledge that you're building to solve tomorrow's problem and tomorrow's problem and tomorrow's problem. That is the capability that allows us to build on the experience but also capture more and more experience to feed into the next generation product and process design. So with each of these things, the frame, the A3 frame, the Hoshin frame, the TPS frame is a frame. The real learning comes from the dialogue through using that frame. And confronting a, a problem and addressing that problem in a systematic, structured way. That's what the frames provide, a systematic, structured way of thinking about the process of problem solving. So actually we're not after reusable knowledge, although that's important, 
what we're actually, the capability we're building is reusable, uh, is reusable learning. Reusable learning that we can apply to solving tomorrow's problems. And we've seen a growth of um, interest in teaching and coaching and mentoring. Um, those crowd people have come out of the woodwork and there's a great army of, uh, of people doing teaching and mentoring and coaching. And that's great, provided it's done in real time in a real problem, facing a real problem. Because arm's length coach theory uh, can only begin to frame your thinking. The real learning comes out of confronting these issues at the Gimba. So, raises some very interesting questions about transformation, which I shall come to a little bit later. So, TPS is actually, at root, a, a learning system. And there's a series of learning frames. The other important thing, I think, is that um, we've spent less time and had less access, so obviously less time and experience in, in understanding the, the development process in Toyota. And yet we can begin to see, I think, that taking systematically capturing knowledge from the user's Gemba, systematically capturing knowledge from the operational Gemba, and running that through a process that runs much faster with a fast attack time, accumulating that and testing it with the marketplace and seeing the reactions on a double attack time, which is essentially what Toyota has done, um, provides the learning basis for, for a faster, incremental, cumulative learning process. And the real value of the chief engineer is the ability not only to guide that process, but also to decide what not to do this time round, and what to do next time round. So the chief engineer makes very, very powerful judgments, personal judgments, about the next iteration of the product or process and the speed with which new technical solutions can be embodied into the next generation process. So I think we can see not only in the development process itself, but in the whole system, the accumulation of learning is actually the foundation for the ability to respond to much more changing circumstances and to survive disruption, provided you have a relentless focus on the customer and a relentless focus on building capabilities and capturing the learning from those capabilities. So, three insights from the book. I hope you enjoy the rest of the book and learn a lot from it. And I think we demonstrate, I think now, that Lean is, yes, absolutely a business strategy. It is a business strategy for building an, an adaptive and learning organization that is much better able to survive in times of rapid change. And it's one that provides meaningful work and builds the capabilities of continuous innovation. So let me now summarize some points for you to think about in the future. I think we have to be much more robust in contrasting the people-centric world that we now fully understand, now we have a better understanding of, with the traditional mental models that are still alive in most managers' heads, of one best way, of the reliance on experts, as I've gone on about before, on rule-based bureaucracies. I mean, we have to find fundamentally different ways of building team-based structures with a lot more autonomy as an alternative to real-based bureaucracies, of traditional leaders driven by financial metrics alone, and traditional change management. Here, I think the Lean Movement, I asked the Lean Movement uh, five or six years ago when I left the Lean Global Network 
to be clear and define a much more sensei-driven approach to change that we have had a lot more experience of recently, as opposed to those traditional methods, consultant level, level programs that I talked about. And I got no reaction. And yet I think in the book we've seen the power of a sensei and the power of the dialogue between the sensei and the leader and the learning process that happens is extremely important at any level in the organisation. But we've also begun to see two leaders who have been through that process sharing with other leaders horizontally. And we need to find mechanisms, more mechanisms, both for building more senseis, developing more senseis, and engaging more organisations with sensei support, but also in sharing and building communities of practice together to, uh, to deepen that learning. And I think the Lean Movement has to articulate an alternative model to change to the traditional change management model. We also have to challenge the big assumptions about technology, that big leaps are the way technology happens. Whereas, in fact, I think we have demonstrated, and Michael talked about uh, Zara and, Le and Amazon and, uh, and Toyota, as being organizations able to survive the disruption because Lean is essentially about learning to do new things. It's essentially about that step having in depth understood the assumptions behind our traditional organization, designing a very different learning organization that can move faster and respond quicker to change. And the second is that automation, people assume, and I think the general public assumes, that automation is the answer to increasing the complexity. And yet, actually, I think the lean experience is that developing the capabilities of addressing the frictions, the tiny problems, that occur day to day builds the capabilities that actually makes a complex system work. So I think you can't build complex systems without people. And that also addresses the future of work issue. Yes, we're going to automate a lot of routine work and routine office work, and that's a really good thing. But we're going to need a lot more people to manage complex processes that constantly are subject to disturbance and to address customer fulfillment issues uh, that are increasingly diverse. So I think, again, the Lean Movement needs to be much bolder in asserting the counter view that a people-centric system actually works better than a purely mechanistic system where the mindset is we're going to automate people out of the equation. And the French Lean Institute has done a great job in uh, pioneering and introducing uh, new topics. The whole Lean IT movement has been really interesting to observe, and I've been very grateful to the, the Institute for organizing those conferences. We've seen the progression, the gradual progression of lean and software development within the IT function. What I think is interesting for the future is as, integration, as IT becomes integrated into every team and every activity, how the hardware and the software learning comes together. And I think the software world, as they emerge from their ivory tower, are going to learn some big, big challenges that they've not yet addressed. So I think we're halfway down the, the path. And I think we're actually only halfway through the digital era, too. We've been obsessed with the development of major platforms and the development of software for big, complex IT systems, which I don't think are the future. What we haven't done is focus on the potential for very simple app development by every individual. Let me just tell you a very quick story. We used to have a friend at the Institute in the UK. We used to have three ladies running the Institute. Eight years ago, I hired Hannah, who systematically went through all of the processes that they'd previously been using and could do the job of three people in one. 
and she became an expert both in uh, inventory management and uh, invoicing systems and web development and so on. We kept building new skills. Hannah has recently gone off to do something else, and Dave's taken over the institute. And Dave has availed himself of all of the existing opportunities, plus some new opportunities with an app developer, a very simple app developer, to outsource and to automate most of the activities running an institute, to the point where now there's about an hour's worth of work a day to run the institute. And yet, we develop the staff who's gone off to run another business uh, for a local, a local community. So I think we, we ignore the fact that very simple app development, do-it-yourself do it apps are going to transform the interaction between the work and the rest of the system for every single individual, not only just individuals but also in organizations. So I think the future is decentralized use of software and use of IT in the information platform. Tremendous initiatives here in France to champion lean approaches to the environment. And I take my hat off to you, and I think you keep doing, doing that. Um, keep using Toyota, as, which is a fantastic model to assess the environmental impact. But also uh, begin to think about different solutions to environmental problems that are happening in all different places around the globe. And finally, the other thing we should, get, we should spend more of our time doing now is inspiring the next generation. I want to close by saying that uh, completely by chance I was rung up not so long ago by somebody who was developing an initiative to start a completely radically new engineering university in my hometown, in Hereford. And that has simply, that has now come to pass and is going to open next year. This is an experiment sponsored by two very powerful traditional universities as an experiment in learning how we can attract women, half, 50% women, how we can train people, not through classroom, in, through projects, in a completely novel, different way. And uh, it's on my doorstep, so I don't have to travel. So I'm going to go back to the classroom. And actually, we're going to blow up the classroom. There will be no classrooms. There will be project rooms, and there will be projects out in the field. And I'm going to take part in... Uh, helping to inspire the next generation. Because that's actually where we started. It's actually an intense, in firing an intense interest in the world that led me to find the Toyota system in the first place. And led most of you to also to find Lean. And if we can fire that in the next generation, and if we can give them experiences that we didn't have, uh, they can take the Lean movement on beyond you. <coughs> So I wish you the best of luck, and I'm going back to basics, <laughs> and I'm not going to travel very much anymore. Uh, a quite extraordinary coincidence to have that, uh, the most innovative experiment we know globally in engineering education is happening in our backyard. So I'm very happy to, uh, to hang up my travel boots and to go back to basics. I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Uh -oh. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to have you open, opening this last session from 
your part, your side. And uh, we in France wanted to thank you so much for your support in all of our initiative. You were present at the first Lean Summit, 2007 or 8, mm -hmm. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You were present uh, at uh, the first Lean IT Summit, mm -hmm. and you really supported this initiative. Mm -hmm. So you were there for every of our ideas, and you were really kind with us, with our increasing knowledge regarding Lean. So thank you from, from France. And I would like to, to give you a, a small symbolic gift. Can we? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.